Lone New Prospect, welcome to RTB 2021 for March 8th, 2021. Hope you are having a great day so far. Uh, so we have some really neat text for us today. Uh, we've got um, we've got Job chapter 37, which is the last of Elihu's speeches. We've got 2 Corinthians 7. Uh, we've got Luke 22, rapidly closing uh, out the story of, of Jesus, right, uh, getting into his trial and and uh, Peter's betrayal and these types of stories that are well known to, to many of us. And then we have Exodus 19, which if I had to uh, choose, I would probably say is my favorite for this, this particular day. I love Exodus 19. In fact, if you remember a few weeks ago, I actually preached on it. So let's dive right in and I'm gonna start with, um, we'll start with Job. Uh, so uh, this, as I mentioned, these are the last of Elihu's speeches and really what Elihu is doing here, um, and, it, and what the author is using Lehu's speeches for is to, is to uh, highlight the greatness of God. Um, now, that has a couple of purposes in the book. Number one, Lehu's trying to uh, convince Job that uh, just because you, uh, because God is so great, you really uh, have no uh, ability to, to quarrel with him or to ask for an audience with him or to uh, bring in... Uh, you bring your questions before him. And of course, um, much of what he says about the greatness of God here, I think we would agree with. Uh, but of course, I think that's a wrong conclusion to make because God is not only just transcendent, but he is also uh, imminent. So again, we see good theology being applied wrongly with Elihu. Uh, but this is also setting up, uh, by the way, Job also has confessed, I believe in chapter 26, maybe, uh, the greatness of God. Uh, but this is also setting up, of course, the chapters to come, the last, uh, not last uh, three chapters, 38, 39, and uh, I'm sorry, 38, 39, 40, and then 41, which are the four chapters there, which are the speeches of, of Yahweh himself, of God himself. And then that gets us to chapter 42, which is kind of the, the narrative uh, ending of the book. Um, but in those, in those last chapters where God reveals himself, that's what he's emphasizing my own greatness. Um, and of course, uh, this is re-emphasizing, I think we'll talk about this uh, in future days, but it'll re-emphasize to Job uh, where true wisdom comes from, how he's to uh, engage with God, and what is the basis of, of faith. And we'll talk about that more when we get there. Uh, let's move over to, to the end of the canon. Let's go to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 7. So in 2 Corinthians, Paul's doing a couple of things here. Uh, number one, he's wrapping up his defense of his ministry and of his uh, apostleship, but really the ministry that he's conducted vis-a-vis -vis the, the Corinthian church. Um, and so, for instance, he says um, that uh, he has, um, I've done no, we've wronged no one, we've corrupted no one, we've taken advantage of no one. So he's again defending himself. Uh, and then he also encourages the Corinthian church. He says, I've taken great pride in you. In verse 4, I'm filled with comfort. Uh, in fact, in verse 16, he, he expresses the same thing. Uh, he says, I have perfect confidence in you. Uh, but in verses 5 and following, he actually begins or continues uh, kind of a discussion of, of uh, his travel plans and things like that that he had started all the way back in chapter 2. Uh, so he had this long defense of his, his ministry and his, his apostleship, and now he's continuing that here in verse 5. And what is interesting about this to me is that um, is, is how he talks to them about the letter that he has sent, probably the, the letter that we don't have for um, the, the, of, of the Corinthian letters, uh, this letter that is um, the, uh, that sar tearful letter that, that scholars sometimes refer to. And he says in verse 8, for if even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it. Uh, in other words, he is chastising him and made him grieve. But he says what this produced in them was ultimately repentance. And notice what uh, godly grief over, and this is not grief over just anything. This is grief over your sin and the sin of the community itself. Look at verse 10. Godly grief produces repentance. Uh, so when we truly grieve over our sin, we repent of it. In fact, those two things I think are inseparable. Uh, grief over our sin uh, produces a, the repentance, and frankly, the repentance uh, brings relief from that grief, ultimately. Um, 
whereas worldly grief, he says, produces death. Uh, so some, some good uh, things to chew on from Paul there in our text today. Uh, that brings us to Luke. We'll look at Luke 22. And uh, we've got several things going on here in Luke 22. Of course, we have Jesus' betrayal by, by Judas, the Passover being celebrated with his disciples. Again, these are things that we've seen in all three of the, uh, of the Gospels that we've studied so far, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Again, these are the synoptic Gospels that see together uh, the, the story of Jesus, and they, they tend to follow the same storyline. Uh, so the, the, some of the same stories and even some of the same wording we're seeing in some of these, um, these Gospels. Luke varies from, from Matthew uh, and Mark more than Matthew varies from Mark and Luke and so on and so forth, but they're all about the same. John's going to be really different. We'll get to that in just a few days. Uh, there's also, of course, the institution of the Lord's Supper. This is something we read uh, every time I try to read this passage, specifically every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper. I'll come back to that in just a minute. Then we have, of course, Peter's denial, uh, Jesus praying on the Mount of, of Olives. We've got a lot of things that we can talk about uh, in this passage. And then finally, we have Jesus put on trial. Uh, so everything is moving very quickly. Again, Luke is a historian. He's trying to give us a kind of the full orb picture of what's going on in these last hours of Jesus's life. Uh, but I think per perhaps the, the highlight of this uh, for even Jesus himself was of course the celebration of that uh, Passover with his disciples. And it's ironic of course that in recent days we've even discussed the Passover uh, as initially celebrated by the, the Israelites in, uh, in, the, in the wilderness. And I'm sorry, in the, um, in the land of Egypt. And so um, we kind of had the historical background there. And again, we talked about how when, we, when uh, the Jews celebrated the Passover, they were, they were remembering what God did for them on their behalf. Uh, but one thing we often don't think about with, in terms of uh, the significance of the Passover is that, of course, it was bringing them to Mount Sinai where God could make a covenant with them. Uh, this covenant, by the way, will be formed in uh, chapter 24 of, it'll be confirmed, I guess, in chapter 24 of Exodus. But here in Luke, um, this is kind of doing the same thing. Jesus is um, instituting this, almost this new covenant with his disciples. This the cup, he says, of the new covenant uh, in my blood. Uh, in other words, the, the means of uh, people coming into right covenant relationship with God is going to be through the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, and that is definitely something to celebrate and it's something to celebrate as a covenant people because we are all part of this uh, covenant family of God. That brings us back to uh, Exodus 19. And what I love about Exodus 19, if you remember again, I preached on this a few, uh, I actually uh, right at the beginning of my sermon series on the Ten Commandments because, of course, this is where Israel arrives at Mount Sinai. And this is where God gives them his commissioning. Uh, God transforms this mountain, this this nondescript mountain, we don't even really know where Mount Sinai is today. This nondescript mountain in the Sinai Peninsula, desert mountain, transforms into, into a heavenly throne room. Can you imagine being there and seeing the lightning, the thunder, and, the, and, and all the displays of God's heavenly glory there on that mountain? And of course, the purpose of that ultimately was to show not just the glory of God, but to, and, and I say this in my many times in my classes, but also I said it in my sermon, this is kind of a divine accommodation to our limited understanding. We can't understand God's infinite glory, and so he displays it in ways that we can't understand, but really it's just the tip of the iceberg of God's glory, and he displays it in this way because he's about to form that covenant relationship with the people of Israel. This is what everything in the Exodus has been driving towards uh, to bring Israel to Mount Sinai for God to reveal himself to them there and to bring them into covenant relationship with them. Uh, everything in the Exodus was the, was the courtship. This is going to be the marriage. And so this is like the, the, the big event, and maybe even in the Old Testament, the big event of, of definitely the book of Exodus, when God uh, forms a relationship with his people and then reveals his will, his covenant uh, to them uh, in these upcoming chapters. So uh, what I what particularly I'm struck with, though, in Exodus 19 is, of course, where God reveals not just 
Uh, the fact that he has brought them to himself for the purpose of forming a covenant relationship, but then he gives their purpose statement. And remember what the purpose statement was, to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, and his treasured possession. So they are to be a nation separated out from the other nations and dedicated to God, and to be a kingdom of priests. In other words, they were to function uh, to the other nations of the world the way the priests were to function for them as a people of Israel. They were to be placed where they were in the promised land so that they could reveal God and mediate God to these other nations, to show the other nations who God is, and they would do it primarily through their holiness. And again, Peter, in uh, 1 Peter 2, uh, chapters 9 and 10, quotes that same passage and says that's the same, um, that's the same role uh, and mission, the statement of the church, not stationed in one place, but scattered among the nations to be a light to the nations, a kingdom of priests to the nations, a holy nation. And the way we are going to display to the world the nature of who our God is, is not just by, um, not just by proclaiming the, the gospel, which is what we should do, uh, but also by living out our lives in holiness, to be a holy nation before the world, separated out from the world and dedicated to God. So love Exodus 19. Uh, and all these other passages as well. So I hope you have a wonderful time studying God's word this day, uh, on this day, March 8th, uh, 2021.